Christ truly who is the head of our lives and who is the head of this church. Amen. My God, thank God for co-pastor and pastors boiling on the pulpit. Thank God for each and every one of you. Amen. We thank God for those that are not here today. We pray that God will continue to keep them and meet their needs and fight their battles to encourage and strengthen them. But I thank God that you are here today. Amen. And truly, God has always given the word. He is faithful. He is faithful. And we thank God for that, that we serve a faithful God, a God that we can trust, that we can tell our innermost secrets to and have the full assurance that we won't hear from another man. Amen. Glory be to God. We can tell him things that we can't tell nobody else. <laughs> Glory be to God. My God. And we thank God for that. We thank God that he is our Savior. Mm. Every day, when we look from where God has brought us from, you got to say hallelujah. Really, when you think about what all Jesus has did for you, we have no reason to walk around with a hung down head. We have no reason to walk around grumbling and mumbling because he has taken some of us here out of some dire situations. He has delivered some of us sitting right here, right now, glory be to God, out of some things that we thought we couldn't make it. He has delivered us out of some things that we were going, thought we were going to lose our mind. We just couldn't take it. But somehow, glory be to God, God brought us through, and we don't remember how he brought us through, when he brought us through. All we know is that I'm not there no more. Glory to God. So you can't help but to bless him and to thank him for who he is. He has done things for you and for myself that no man could have ever done. Hmm. Oh, I just wonder, just love on Jesus. I mean, he's just marvelous. He's awesome. He's righteous. He's true to his word. My God. He said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And he's right here with us. He's right there with you in the midst of your storms, in the midst of your trials and tribulations. You're not by yourself. Glory be to God. You're walking, my God, with Jesus. You're in the palm of his right hand, and John declares, can no man take me out? My God, he said, life and death is in the power of his hands. Uh, who would not want to serve a God like that? <laughs> Glory to God, that we are on the victorious side. Oh, and I bless God today. I really do. I thank him. Through all that's going on in the earth right now, yet he has still kept us. We continually pray for those who have Lost loved ones down there in Florida with their condo. You know, it really hurt my heart. I mean, death always is rough, but when you hear little children coming out dead like that, that's really bothered me. But God is in control, amen? God is in control. And he has given us a word. Just one scripture, actually. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Just one verse. Let your light shine before men that they may see, they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bless you this day. We honor you, we exalt you, we lift you up. We glorify your holy and righteous name, my Lord, because truly you are so great and greatly to be praised. We want to thank you, my God, for your mercy. We want to thank you for your compassion, your favor. Thank you for your wisdom, my Father. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit today will speak through me, teach through me, do what you have to do, say what you want to say. For well, this is your house. We are the sheep of your pasture. I thank you and I praise you in advance for the opportunity, the privilege to stand behind this sacred desk and to proclaim your word one more time. I thank all that's going to be accomplished, my God. All that's going to be accomplished, deliverance, healing, setting free, revelation, my God, instruction and guidance. And God, we just give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor in advance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Yeah, man, you may be seated. You may be seated. 
just want to ask you a question. Maybe you never saw this verse like that, but how are you perceived? How do people see you? How do people see you? Well, if you read this, where Jesus starts actually in verse 13 all the way down to 16, he's trying to encourage us today. He's trying to encourage us. And the first thing that he says in verse 13, that you are the salt of the earth. <laughs> and as I was reading that, I said, Lord, look at this. You're telling us that we are the salt of the earth. In other words, we are the seasoning and the preservers of the earth. We are the salt. But salt that has not been used or left in the sun too long, it becomes no good. Amen? So he says that we are somebody in this earth, and we're here for a reason, to season the earth and to preserve. Preserve what? His word, yes. But we are the ones that's supposed to, glory be to God, step into a situation, and people can see something different in us. Then he goes on to say, glory be to God, that we are the light of this world. That when we go through any situation, anything that's dark, we are supposed to light it up. I just wonder, when you walk into a place that's dark, do you add to the darkness? How are you perceived? How are you perceived? So he goes on to say, let your light so shine before men that they may see or perceive your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That word perceived, it means to interpret or to look on someone or something in a particular way. It is how you perceive yourself. It is how others perceive you. Are you perceived according to the flesh or are you perceived according to the spirit? And I'll give you a book on that in a moment. But how do people perceive you when, they, when you walk into their presence? Do they judge you according to your flesh? or to the flesh, or do they judge you with a spiritual judgment? Do they look at you, my God, and say, that's a child of God right there. That's a child, that's a Christian. Or do they say, oh, that's just Mary or Jack, you know who they are. That's just one of the more Christians. How do they perceive you? How do people look at you? How do you look at yourself? Because the way that you perceive yourself is a direct indication of how people are going to perceive you. If you say you're a Christian, but you act like the devil, <laughs> that's how people are going to perceive you. I'm so sorry to burst a bubble, but as Christians, there's certain places that we shouldn't be hanging out. There's certain things that we shouldn't be doing. I'm not saying that as Christians we don't go into bars, because why not? Jesus hung out with the publicans. How, how are you going to save a sinner if you don't go where they are? We should not be so hypocritical that, oh, I can't go in bars, I can't go here, I can't smoke, I don't drink. No, we don't do that anymore. But you know something? We used to do it. We used to do it. And it's, it's a sorry Christian that turns their nose up at people who do the same thing that God has delivered you out of. Now you're around someone that smokes, and oh my goodness, that smells so bad. But you smell the same way if God had not delivered you. You know you used to drink more than Johnny Walker could make. You know that. If you were drinking Johnny Walker, there's some, glory be to God, who was drinking Boone's Farm, Gypsy Rose, MD 2020, Thunderbird. Like, you don't know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. And that's part of the problem. We kind of erase certain things out of our memory. But those certain things God has delivered you out of. So how do people perceive you? As I just said, no, you don't hang out in those places. But if God sent you to those places, sent you there for a reason, to be a light in a dark place, to be a light in a dark place. Remember, you are the salt. You are the seasoning. You are the seasoning. We are Jesus' hands and feet in this earth. And we are called to be a light in this earth to people who are living in darkness. 
but how do they perceive you? Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 says, But I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. You are either walking in the spirit or you walking in the flesh. It kind of reminds you of that little cartoon that you see on TV where you have the devil on one side and the angel on the other side and both of them are talking, but which one is going to, you're going to listen to? We are spirit beings and we should be led by the Holy Spirit, not by our flesh, because I just gave you the scripture that flesh is an enmity against God, against the spirit of God. The flesh will not lead you into any good thing. It will not. It will not. If you read, my God, before the fruit of the spirit is given, it's the, the works of the flesh is called. That's not even called fruit. It's called the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. And the works of the flesh, as you read this, you may not say, well, I, I never killed nobody. But I am dare say there might have been a time in your life where you were so mad, you said, I could kill you if. If you was ever put in that kind of a situation, I could have done it if I had the knife in my hand, but something stopped me. I was going to knock you in the head with a bottle, but something stopped me. Because it's all in your flesh. It's in your flesh. And if you allow yourself to be walking in the flesh, there's no telling in what direction it's going to take you. You must be careful. You must walk in the spirit because we're talking about how people perceive you, how people look at you. What do they see when they see you coming? Do they see a child of God or do they see someone who is just like them? Walk in the light, my God, in the light, because you are the light of the world. That men can see your good works. Men can see, can perceive, can look upon you. See, good works is not all the time you walking around giving a scripture or giving a track. That's part of your Christian function. But good works exceeds more than that. It's the way that you carry yourself. The way you carry yourself. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, he says this, having your conversation honest among men. Let's stop there before I read any more. Having your conversation honest among Gentiles. So that's the first thing that we talk about is the way you talk, the way you speak. That's part of your good works. What comes out of your mouth? Do you only speak righteously when you're around Christians on, on Sunday? Or how do you speak from Monday to Saturday? How was your conversation then? How was your conversation? Do you have a righteous conversation? Does your conversation when you speak uplift people or discourage people? Are you an encourager or are you a discourager? What kind of person are you? How is your conversation? What is your conversation? What do you talk about? Now we are in the flesh, I understand it. I am a man so I talk sports, I talk all kinds of stuff. But I don't talk that lustful stuff. I love sports. I talk sports to people who understand sports. But those who, who never endear, uh, had anything to do with sports, they don't understand it. Jesus talked to sa farmers in the word in a way that they understood what he was talking about. He talked to fishermen in the way that they knew what he was talking about. The best way that in your conversation you can get somebody's attention is meet them where they are. Why would you go out there and give a thousand scriptures to somebody who has no idea what you're talking about? But I have found if you talk to someone sitting out there on the street, a homeless person, and one thing you ask them, what made you get into this situation? What happened to you? And you'll be surprised at some of the things that you hear. Well, I had a good job and I lost it. And when I lost my job, not only did I lose my job, but I lost my family. Because when I lost my job, I got so down on myself, I started drinking and drugging, and I lost everything that I had. 
And this is the consequence for it. I'm out here on the street. Now you are able to witness and be a light to a dark situation. Now you are able to talk to this person on the level where they are. But if I pop scripture to you and I don't care nothing about where you come from, it's like James says, how can a person come in and say that I'm hungry? And you say, okay, I'll pray for you later on and keep stepping. You got to meet the need first. And then they will accept Christ. They've had enough about, okay, I'll pray for you. But their needs have not been met. But how can you meet a person's need if you don't know what they need? You would be surprised if you speak to homeless people. You hear what they say, how they got where they are. And by the grace of God, and only by his grace, you and I are not there. Because you know goodness well, you have suffered some hard knocks in your life. You know goodness well, glory be to God, if it was not just for Jesus Christ, you and I would be on the street. You know that. If he had not met your need when you needed your need met, you would be on the street. You would be in a house with no lights, no water, no heat. But Jesus. So the first part, having your conversation honest among Gentiles. And that conversation also means honesty. It means sometimes you're going to have to tell folk what God has delivered you from. Stop trying to be this holier than thou that I ain't never had no problems in my life. Sometimes when Jesus will never allow nobody to come in your path to, for you to minister to that you cannot minister to. He will always send people in your path that you have had something in common with. If you was a drug addict, he will send you or send a drug addict in your path because they understand when you talk to them, they understand that you've been there. Paul tells us with the same compassion that Jesus Christ has showed us, that's the same compassion that we should show others. I think I told you, for a lot of years, people would come down to the altar and they, for, for healing. And I would pray the prayer of faith. But because I had never been sick, never been in a hospital, I was praying, but I didn't have that real compassion because I didn't know what they were feeling. Honesty. So what God had to do, when I was younger, I got hit in my eye with a hardball. And as I got older, it grew, it grew into a cataract. So I had to have the cataract removed. But what, the, what, what I got out of that, while I was in the waiting room, sitting there, waiting to go in, people sitting next to me, they went in there one way. And when they went in there, I'm hearing howling and screaming. And then they come out another way, all bent over, bandaged up. So I learned from that that it's not actually the surgery, it's the fear of the surgery. Before you get into that emergency room, that fear that jumps on you, oh my God. Because I was scared to the point I wanted to go home. I was willing to have that one eye, see out of one eye. But I had to learn. And then when people came down to this altar to pray for healing, I had compassion. Because I understood exactly what they was going to have to go through. And I knew how to pray. It's kind of rough when you're going to pray for somebody and you don't know what their need is. Let your conversation be honest. Tell people what you used to be. Tell people that you used to do certain things. Because God's going to send them in your path. He is going to send them in your path. Maybe in the past you have turned your back on them. Or you have tried to change the conversation. But God's going to send them. He didn't save you for yourself. He saves you for others because you are supposed to be a light. Too many times we're so caught up in our own situations. We're so caught up in, the, in our woe is me that we don't look at for other people. We neglect what the word of God says. If I do what the kingdom of heaven says, God's going to take care of my needs too. Yes, he is. 
Have you ever wanted prayer for yourself? And God would send somebody to you and say, pray for me. Hmm? You needed prayer. Looking for somebody to pray for you. And God had to mitigate it gall to send somebody in your path. And they said to you, pray for me. And as you began to pray for that person, your deliverance started to come too. Because that's the word of God. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. What does it say? But we get so caught up in our own self. <laughs> Me first, and I'll take care of you later. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. Having your conversation honest among Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, which they will do, that they may see your good works, which they shall behold and glorify God in the day of visitation. So even though they speak in bad against you, glory be to God, call you all kinds of names, the one thing they can't talk about you is that you didn't help them, your good works. You know, people in the world expect bad. They do. They expect bad. When they give bad, they expect bad back. But the word says that when someone does you and I bad, we ought to do good to them. It's like pouring coals of fire on their head. What they think they should get, they're not going to get. Because we are not built like that. We should not be built like that. There should be no, be no revenge factor in our Christian walk. Should not be. Because someone has betrayed you or hurt you, God has a way later on in life to send that very same person in your path. Oh, yes, he will. It happened. That very same person. And they, they're going to ask you to pray for them. How are you going to pray? Are you going to pray with malice? Or are you going to pray that you, for the, from the love of God that's implanted in you? How are you going to do it? I told you. I told you before. Everything I'm telling you, I'm not telling you out of a book. Out of my first marriage of hell for that one year to a woman that I wanted to kill. Yeah. I wasn't saved then, so. But years later, when I went back to Buffalo with my daughters, or two of my daughters, that same woman came limping to me, came limping, and asked me to pray for her knee. This is the same woman that I wanted to kill. But because Jesus Christ had changed my heart, because I wanted to change. Because it's a bad thing walking around with unforgiveness. You make yourself sick. I laid hands on her knee, and God recovered her. But I didn't pray out of malice. I wanted to see her healed. Because all souls belong to God. Amen. And if God prompted this woman to come into my presence again after that one year of hell, there was a reason why. So I'm talking to somebody here or who's going to view. You can't walk around with unforgiveness because God, you're going to be tested. You're going to be tested. Yeah. Let your light so shine among men. Glory be to God. So the purpose of all good works among men is to glorify God. It is not to glorify you. The purpose of good works, the purpose of letting your light shine is to glorify the Father. That he can be glorified in this earth. That we should be thankful that he has chosen you, my God, to be his hands and his feet in this earth. And that he has equipped you to be successful. Titus 2.14 says, who gave himself for us, talking about Jesus, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. We are peculiar. I told you earlier that people would expect bad from us because they did bad to us. They don't expect the opposite. 
Don't expect the opposite. Zealous for good works, looking to do good, wanting to do good, because it's glorifying the Father. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Now, this is beautiful. This is talking about perception. Again, may I tell you how people perceive you, how people look at you? Many times you don't even have to say anything. Just the way you carry yourself, people can know there's something peculiar about you. There's something different about you. There's something. I, don't, I can't put my finger on it. I can't put my finger on it. But there's something different. Just like as we as Christians and you see some friends that you grew up with, and you, you see them years later, and here you have Jesus, and they don't have Jesus. They look at you and they ask you, what happened? You look so good. What you do, lose weight? What you do? They can't put their finger on it. Something is different about you. And then they say, remember so-and-so? They did. Remember so-and-so? They did. Remember so-and-so? They in jail. Remember so-and-so? They still on the corner doing the same thing. But you flip the conversation. But you say, thank God for Jesus, and all of a sudden they walk away. You don't want to hear it, but you still, you are the light. You are the light, and you plant the seed. You plant the seed. And then many times, you are the evidence of your seed. <laughs> yeah, you are the evidence. When you say Jesus saves, they looking at you. You are the evidence that Jesus saves. Yes. But how do people perceive you? In 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter, I think, 4, yeah, chapter 4, Elisha, Elisha. We know in the first part of chapter 4, Elisha sees the, the woman who just lost her husband, and they want to take her son. They want to take her son as surety to pay debts. And Elisha asks a question, I'll paraphrase it. You can read it in, in your own leisure. He says, what can I do for you? He says, I have nothing but a little bit of oil in my house. He says, go and borrow pots of oil. Go borrow pots and bring it into your house. And the, one of the key words there, he says, and close the door. <laughs> close the door. And it says, she sent her son out to borrow all the pots. They brought the pots, closed the door. And she began to pour oil into all of these pots. The oil kept running. Every empty pot that she had, oil came into it until all the oil stopped. And she went to Elisha and said, all the oil has stopped flowing. He says, now take this oil, go pay your debts, and go live off the rest. The very next verses after that, here Elisha now is walking by a rich woman. And it says every time, every so often that he passed by her house, she invited him in to eat bread. It happened continually to the point, glory be to God, that she said to her husband, I perceive, I see that this is a holy man of God. It does not say any place in scripture that he witnessed anything to her. All he did was walk by. Maybe she heard what he did for the woman. I don't know. Scripture doesn't say it. But in this particular text, all it says that he walked by. Who knows when he was sitting down eating bread with her. He didn't try to glutton all the food. He just had enough to satisfy himself, but made sure they was taken care of. I don't know what he said when he got into the house. Maybe he asked them, is there anything that I can do for you? Maybe he talked to them in such a way that he met them right where they are. Maybe he asked them, you know, what do you do for a living? Conversation. As Christians, you know, we do have conversations. Oh, yes. You know, I'm bothered by Christians who all they, can, all they say to me, glory to God, glory to God, bless his name. They have no conversation. I'm bothered by them kind of Christians. I really am. Because man, you in flesh. Or woman, you in flesh. 
All they talk, I mean, all that's all they say. Man, it's raining outside. Glory to God. It's raining down blessings right now. No, it's raining outside right now. I'm not going to get wet. So it, says, so it says Elisha. So much so that she perceived, she saw, she understood, she recognized that this was a holy man of God to the point that she went to her husband and said, let's make a room for him that when he passes by, he has some place to sleep. Now, the husband had to recognize that this was a holy man of God. This is talking about spiritual perception, not fleshly perception. Because any man in his right mind is not going to have some dude come live in his house where his wife is. I don't care who it is. But there had to be some spiritual perception here. That means Elisha was judged by his spiritual walk and not by his fleshly walk. Second Kings chapter 4. Perception. So again, how do people perceive you? How do people look at you? What do they say when they look at you? What do they say? Oh, God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. What was her perception? I tell you, what was her perception? What was it based upon? It was not a carnal or fleshly perception, but a spiritual perception. Elisha walked in the spirit. Whatever he was doing, whatever his works were, it was glorifying the Father. Amen? That is our responsibility as children of God. Not to glorify ourselves, but to glorify our Father by good works. By, good, by the way that we live, and I'll give you scriptures in a moment. By the way that we live by the way that we carry ourselves. Let our light so shine. Our light should shine in darkness. We are in this world, but the word says we are as pilgrims passing through. So there are things that we go through in this world that the world goes through. We all have gone through and are going through this coronavirus, are we not? God did not, by his mercy, just take us up on a, a wings and fly us over the coronavirus. We are right in the midst of it. But what is your conversation in the midst of this coronavirus? What is your conversation? Do you have a spiritual perception or a carnal one? How do you speak about the coronavirus when people, my God, that are not saved start talking about this virus? What do you say? What is your response? Or do you say, yeah, that's true, you know, that's really true. Or do you say God is in control? God's in control. What is your conversation? Do you respond the same way the world responds to the coronavirus? Do you respond the same way that your co-workers respond on your job against the, the CEO or against the supervisor that was nasty and mean? Do you walk around the water cooler or at lunch or on your break and talk about them? What is your conversation? What is your conversation? Can people determine who you are by your conversation? Can they? Glory to God. Bless the name of Jesus. Mm. So Elisha was recognized by his life. By his life. It's talked about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. What he did. He says he left Nazareth. The place was his home. He left Nazareth, and he went to a place called Capernaum, where he did all the miracles at. But it says this in Matthew 4, 16. It says, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. Mm, stop. So therefore, the Lord is going to send us to places where there is great darkness. Oh, I know you want to go someplace where everybody is praising God, which we do. Everybody's praising God and hallelujah, glory be to God. Shanda da bo, shanda de be, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, sometimes you're going to go into a place where there's total darkness. 
where people are under demonic attack. And you are the light. You have the power and you have the authority, glory be to God, to get in there and do the work that God the Father can be glorified. Because the footsteps of a righteous man slash woman are ordered by God. And the next part of that says this, and he slash she delighteth in the way. Stop complaining about going places where God is sending you. If God is ordering your footsteps, he's setting you there because you are a light. He's setting you there because he can trust you, that you're not going to be in there and be a partaker of the foolishness, that you're going to stand fast. You're not going to walk according to the flesh, but you're going to walk according to the spirit and be led by the Holy Spirit, speak what the Holy Spirit says to do, and do what the Holy Spirit says do. Because it says Jesus went to a people that were in great darkness, and he was the light. To them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light sprung up. They were in the shadow of death, and light sprung up. Could it be that God is going to send you to some people who are con con contemplating suicide? He's going to send you to some people who have just given up hope on life altogether? Life has dealt them, my God, to their own opinion, life has dealt them some hard blows that they don't want to even make it no more. And here God sends you with a word. How can he send you? Because you've been there. Don't tell me that you have not once in your life considered, this is, I'm tired of all of this. I'm just take a gun and bang, shoot myself. Probably the gun wouldn't even shoot when I try to shoot myself. Because life has dealt me so hard knocks. I went through this thing, now I'm going through this. I'm going through this, now I'm going through this. I'm going through this, now I'm going through this. Every place I turn, I'm going through something. I'm just tired, tired, tired. Tired. There has to be more to life than this. If not, take me out of here, Lord. And here God sends you with a word. With a word. Because you are the light. And light dispels the darkness. Here you come. Your works are going to glorify the Father. Someone who the adversary was trying to bring to hell. God's going to use you to spring them up. That's what the word says. Light has sprung up. Light has sprung up. You see, when you are sent by God, you know you're going to be victorious. But you have to believe that. You got to believe it. You have to learn to stop complaining. Stop complaining. Stop asking God all the time, why me? Why, why not you? Who the heck are you that things can't bother you? Huh? Who are you that trouble can just bypass you? That you can live a life just walking, tipping through the tulips? Not so. Jesus says, because he suffered persecution, we shall suffer persecution. But be of good courage, I have overcome the world. You know, sometimes you should say, thank God for trouble, because trouble is going to advance me closer to God. Going to push me closer to God. There's not nobody in here who has God has not delivered out of something that didn't make you get closer to him. There's some things that you have went through that you prayed like you were crazy. Oh, yeah. You prayed like you were crazy because this thing was really bothering you. You made sure you got up early in the morning and prayed like you, oh, God, bombarding heaven. We are the light of the world. We are the light. We are to glorify the Father, the perception, how people see us. Now, what about us? What perception do we have? Well, number one, clean bodies. Now, this is going to bother some people. Too bad. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 
Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? That the spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? Let me ask that again, the last part of that. Which temple are ye? Hmm. You you all know the scripture. It goes on to say a lot of stuff about separating and all that stuff. But the temple. And how does the temple and perception, how does that come together? And how does that glorify God the Father? Because as Christians, we are supposed to carry ourselves a certain way. Are we not? You cannot be at the dinner table and don't push the, ta- the chair away until everything is gone. You cannot be that kind of Christian in a, soup, in a restaurant that the waitress, when they see you coming, they go on break. Because they know you're going to ask for more bread, you're going to ask for more soda, you're going to ask them for all kind of stuff. You ain't never satisfied. And then you're going to leave them a track on the table, Jesus loves you, after you abuse them. You abuse them. These temples are the temple of the Holy Spirit, these bodies. And we are not to put stuff in these bodies that's going to defile these bodies. No, it does not say don't drink liquor. No, it does not say don't smoke. But those, the world tells you they are no good for your body. The world tells you that. So we know what we should put in our body and what we shouldn't put in our body. We know that we should not be gluttonous. We know that we should just eat enough to that sustain us. We have to learn. This is what this is talking about. Oh, God, I don't want to say this, but Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, hold me. I'm not talking. I'm talking to people up here. The word says, exercise profits little, but it does profit. But apparently, God's children don't exercise. Because if you want to see people that are very healthy, 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 Come into church. Come into church. You will see people that are healthy, 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 healthy. I'm not talking about this is what the Holy Spirit is telling me to tell you. And then you're going to try to witness to people and they're looking at you. Looking at you. You're going to tell me God is a healer. Well, why ain't you healed? This is talking about works. This is works. Your works is not just giving tracts and, and glory be to God, giving scripture. Your works is how you carry yourself and what you do to yourself, how you handle yourself. Your Christian profession, 2 Corinthians 9 and 13. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. In other words, Christians are not selfish. Christians are givers. Christians are got their hand always see if I can help you, not with their hand always closed. Liberal, this is a sign of being a child of God, that we are givers. We are givers. And God has never failed. When you give, God always gives back. And you can never outdo God's giving. I'm telling you that. You never can. If God will tell you right now, Right now, and God gave me an example out there this morning, even though it wasn't my last five dollars, but God told me to do it for this person. If God says, take your last dollar and go over there and give it to somebody, would you do it or are you going to argue with God first? God, you know this is all I got. 
You know this got to hold me till next week. God, you know. You know. But if this money in your pocket is your last and it has to profit you, you might as well walk around with an empty pocket so God can fill it. Many times I have been broke and given my last. I went into the Chinese restaurant. Chinese restaurant. And on the floor was an envelope. An envelope. I stepped on it and went, kept on going by. I was brought back to it. I picked it up. And I noticed a whole bunch of names on it. All the names were crossed out. Crossed out. Opened it up. There were five $20 bills inside the envelope. Now, Crazy Eddie, that's me, was going to take it and give it back to the, give it to the Chinese man behind the window there. Because when the person comes, they ask for, did they, you see anybody find anything? You give it to them. But saying Eddie said not so. I put that $100 in my pocket because my pocket was empty because I had gave all my money in church. There are many times we have testimonies in this church. People didn't even have bus fare. They got to the bus stop and there was money laying on the ground. Wallets laying with nobody's name in it. So when you do what God tells you to do, God is a faithful God. He will supply your needs. But God cannot deal with stingy people. He cannot. That is not a characteristic of the Most High God being stingy. Completing God's work is another way that we glorify God. Jesus says in John chapter 17, the priestly prayer. I love that, John 17. John chapter 17, verse 4. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. My God, one thing that glorifies God, that you start a work and you finish it. Stop being a procrastinator. When God has put something in your spirit to do, do it so he can be glorified. Stop procrastinating and ask 10 people, should I do this? If God is putting it in your spirit to do it, do it. Jesus says, I have glorified the Father in this earth. I have finished the work that God has called me to do. What is God telling some of you all to do that you have procrastinated about? Hmm? What is he telling you to do? He's been telling you to do for years. Telling you to join this auxiliary. Telling you to do this and to do that. Telling you, my God, to be a mentor to people. Telling you something. But you're finding reasons why you cannot finish the work that God has assigned for you to do. And this is the reason why there's no elevation. Because you can't finish that. God's not going to elevate you to something bigger. You have to be faithful in small things before you can be elevated to bigger things. But if you're not faithful in small stuff, if you've got to be prodded, my God, and pushed and shoved to do stuff that you suppose to have been done a long time ago. Procrastination is a killer of the gifting of God's children. Procrastination. Perception, perceiving something. People, whenever I meet people, especially Christians, those that are in leadership, ministers and bishops and apostles. They all say the same thing to me that I don't perceive in myself. They say, you have a humble spirit. You are so humble. But I don't perceive that in me. I don't. But everybody says it. You are so humble. And I say, now, wait a minute, how could I be so humble? I'm trying to figure it out. Because I'm trying to relate that humbleness to carnal or fleshly attributes. This is a spiritual attribute that God has given. Humility. That I, my God, being in the front does not bother me. I'm just as happy sitting in the back. I really am. Just as happy sitting in the back. I don't know about you, but in the old church, what used to really bother me? I would change my seat on many different occasions, on different services. Because every single time a preacher would come in there, they would call me out. If I sit over there, they call me out. 
I sit in the middle, they call me out. I'm over there, they call me out. I said, I'll fix you. I sat over there where the drums was. They called me out. Because there was something, and is something, in me that I didn't perceive. And there's something in all of you, some spiritual attribute in you that you do not perceive, but it's in you. This is why you do certain things that other people would not do. This is why you put your hands to stuff that other people deem it to be nasty or filthy. I could never do that. Because this God has placed stuff in you that God the Father can be glorified. You can't fake humility. You cannot fake it. You will be tested if you are a humble person. Because the only way you're going to be elevated is that you have to be humble. Pride comes before the what? And a haunty spirit? But a humble person, God can elevate. And that's what happens. And see, and I love talking about me because therefore you can't get mad with me talking about me. I've learned that from my previous pastor. If I talk about you, you get attitudes, you get offended, and all that kind of stuff. And I really don't have time for that. Too many years we had to preach offense every Sunday for years. Every service, every scripture was offense. So much so we got to think about changing the name from greater Zion to greater offense. <laughs> but it had to be that way. It had to be like that to get to the place where you are now. But the word says, let your light so shine. And God has allowed me, truly has allowed me to see you, maybe in ways that you don't see yourself. That's one of the gifting that God gives a pastor. He's able to see, to see and perceive things in you that you don't see in yourself. And therefore, I'm able to push you in a direction that God wants you to be. Because maybe you hadn't seen it there, but now you see it. Case in point, there was a sister here right now, right now. That one sister was in a position of authority, and still is, but not in that same position. And they was tired of that position. God told me to tell the person over there, now you're going to assume that position. They went, ah! You know how chickens do, you know. <laughs> they didn't understand, looking all around. But now they see the reason why God put them there. Because the person that was previously there couldn't do what this person is doing. Amen? I'm not going to mention Sister Evangelist Lewis' name, okay? Just don't worry about it. But we see now the gifting of the Lord overtaking her from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. We see God maneuvering her and shaping her. Come down here, sister evangelist. Glory be to evangelist. We see God right now. Hmm. We see God. He allowed me to see the boldness. Ah, shot Tadoboshe. When contractors was coming to the church first and then our parsonage, and they came with these funny numbers, this little short lady right here got up into the man's face and said, ha, not so. You want to do better than this? And I looked at her. Because up until this time, I never heard her raise her voice. But I found glory to God. Dealing with her and different now at the parsonage, you see the gift things coming out of her. Somebody take her glasses. Coming out of her. We see God maneuvering. We see God shaping. We see God doing, my God, now what he projected way back then that you couldn't see. And God let me know up here today, that because you have been faithful, and because, because, 
Tarabasa Kandarobo Sende de Bese Keka Tarabosai. Hey, hey, Eke and Arabo Sandarabasata. I'm going to bless you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. I'm going to maneuver you. Glory be to God. I'm going to save your family. I'm going to save everyone in your family. I'm going to save your son. I'm going to save your daughters. I'm going to save your nieces. I'm going to save your nephews. I'm going to work a work in your house. Glory be to God that you cannot receive because you are the light. Because you said yes to me. Because you said yes to me. Because you said yes to me. Shanda Rabo Shaka. Ete Yanda Rabo Shaka Nde. Eke Yanda Rabo Shanda Rabo Shanda. No contractor is going to be able to take advantage of you. Ah, because I have given you wisdom. 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 It is so in Jesus' name. Ah, Kandara, come on and praise God with her. Kandara, come on, say the day, baby. You want to please the Father in here? Psalms 50, 23 says, Whosoever offers praise glorifies God. You want to praise God, glorify the Father? Psalms 50 and 23 says, Whosoever praises the Lord glorifies God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 How are you perceived? How are you perceived? Do people see your light? Or do they see you in another way? Do they recognize and do they realize that you are a child of God? How do they see you? When you walk down the street, do dogs don't bark at you no more because they recognize the spirit of the Lord is wrong? When you go someplace, does favor overtake you? Glory be to God in the name of Jesus. My God, because you are a child of God. Do you understand the word says you are the head and not the tail? You are above and not beneath. You're blessed coming in and blessed going out. That means to me, I don't know about you, that wherever I go, I go I'm blessed. I don't know about you. Wherever I touch, I'm good to go. Glory be to God. How do people perceive? How do you perceive yourself? Is your esteem so low that this is what you project to people? Because you do not feel good about yourself, that projects out of you, that the way you carry yourself, that you don't feel that you should get anything because your self-esteem is so low. Life has beat you down so bad, my, the treaters are so bad for so long, you just have just given up. I'm never going to have nothing, never going to be nothing, never going to go no place, never going to have nothing at all. I'm just going to live this way until God takes me home. How do you feel about yourself? How do you perceive yourself? How, 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 how? Do you equate your life 
according to the way your mother and father lived their lives? Do you feel that you're not going to have because they didn't have? Hmm? How do you perceive yourself? Your life should be greater and better than your mama, than your daddy, than your grandmama, than your granddaddy. You have the power and you have the authority that you can go down to 10 generations and curse every generational curse. You have the authority, you have the power to go down 10 generations and curse every satanic, satanic, every demonic, every incantation, every, my God, that was offered up with your name on it. You have the authority, you have the power to cancel it right now in Jesus' name. I am not one of those that align myself with the poor man Christian mentality. I believe as a Christian, we're supposed to be blessed above measure. Blessed above measure. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But know the way that you perceive yourself is a clear indication of how you carry yourself. Know this, that you're somebody special. I started off by telling you Jesus said that you are the salt of the earth. That means you are the preserver. You are the sweetener. You are the one that God sends into situations to make it better. Where it was bitter, you step in and make it sweet. You are a preserver of the word of the Lord. You're not going to be deterred. You're not going to compromise. You're going to say what thus saith the Lord. Glory be to God, because it's not your word, it's God's word. And God says, I send my word, and it will accomplish that which I send it out to do. But I'm sending it out through you, that you can be the light in the earth, that men can see your good works and glorify my daddy, your daddy, is, which is in heaven. How do you perceive yourself? How do you do it? How do you perceive yourself? <laughs> How do you? How do you perceive yourself? How do you see yourself? Do you think that you're always going to be afflicted? Do you think God can't heal? The word says that he wished that you prosper and be in good health as your soul also prospers. So are we going to believe the word of the Lord? Or are we going to believe what man says? Or are we even what our body says? Nah. I can't buy into that. I really can't. God did not bring me this far to buy into a bunch of foolishness. He has proven himself to me, and I'm quite sure he has proven himself to everybody sitting in here, that Jesus Christ is Lord. He has proven himself. Jesus Christ is Lord. And if he's Lord, that means he's Lord over everything. Everything. He is a perfecter. Yes, he is. He is a perfecter of those things that concern us. But he's telling us today, let our light so shine in this earth that men can see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. We ought to be a light. But in order to be a light with good works, your perception of yourself has to be according to his will. That means you walk in the spirit, Galatians 5, and not in the flesh. Amen? Walk in the spirit. And you can't turn it on like you do a gas range on and off. You have to walk this way. You have to walk this way. Is it hard at first? Yeah. But when people begin to say, oh my gosh, there's something different about you, you understand that you're on the right path. You understand that. 
Stand to your feet, please. I said I wasn't going to be here long today. I believe that I have said what God wanted me to say to this house, to this people, and to those that will review it later on. It's important to understand. But before I go any further and offer the, the salvation call, are there any needs in this house right now? This altar is open. Are there any needs in here right now? Glory be to God. If you want somebody to touch and agree with you, this altar is open. If you know that you have an appointment this week, some kind of appointment, you have some kind of obligation this week, come down here and let someone touch and agree with you for favor. I spoke to you last week and I told you, I told you, whatever you have plans for your life, put Jesus first. I told you, if you have a doctor's appointment, if you feel something going on in your body and you don't know what it is, put Jesus first. And by the time you get to the doctor's office, Jesus could already have healed you when you put him first. Don't wait till you get to the doctor's office and get a diagnosis, then you're going to go to Jesus. Put him first. So if there's anything going on this week with you, anything going on this week, I don't care what it is. If you're looking for a job, if you're looking for a job and you need somebody to touch and agree, the altar is open. The altar is open. You sister right here. 